The Bolsheviks Come to Power by Alexander Rabinowitch. Chapter 5 The Bolshevik Resurgence. On the night of July 26th, in a spacious private assembly hall in the heart of the Vyberg district, some 150 Bolshevik leaders from all over Russia gathered for the opening of the party's long awaited 6th Congress. This National Assembly of Bolshevik officials began with the election of Lenin, Trotsky, Kamenev, Kolontai, and Lunikarsky to the posts of Honorary Congress Co-Chairman, and ended 15 sessions and eight days later with the signing of the International. In the interim, the delegates listened to formal greetings and statements of encouragement from the Petrograd Trade Union Soviet the American Socialist Workers' Party, jailed soldiers and officers of the Petrograd garrison, 21 military regiments in Riga, several thousand Putilov factory workers, three Petrograd district Soviets, the Muslim Social Democratic Organization in Baku, and more than a dozen other various and sundry labor organizations and political institutions. The delegates received detailed first-hand status reports from representatives of the Central Committee, the Petersburg Committee, the Military Organization, and the Inter-District Committee, which now formally merged with the Bolshevik Party, as well as from emissaries of 19 major provincial party organizations. Most important, they hammered out official positions on the question of Lenin's refusal to submit to the authorities and on broad political problems such as the war issue and the current Russian economic and political situation. Finally, lest the assembled delegates had overlooked anything, they reconfirmed all of the resolutions adopted by the April conference. The work of the 6th Congress proceeded in an atmosphere of extreme tension, heightened periodically by rumors that the Kerensky administration was on the verge of raiding and dispersing the Congress. These rumors acquired increased credibility on July 28th, the third day of the Congress, when the government published a decree authorizing the ministers of the interior and of war to ban any assemblies or Congresses deemed harmful to the war effort or to the security of the state. Following this, the Congress's meeting place was quietly switched to an out-of-the-way workers club belonging to the inter-district committee in the Narva district on the southwest outskirts of the capital. Roughly simultaneously, party officials supervised election of a smaller congress which, meeting separately, agreed on a public manifesto to be issued in the event that the congress was actually broken up and hurriedly elected a new central committee to direct Bolshevik activities until the next National Party Congress. The mood of the embattled delegates in these trying circumstances was vividly reflected in the emotional reception which they gave to a speech by Yuri Larin, a Menshevik internationalist, who a few weeks after the Congress joined the Bolshevik Party. Of this moment, Ilan Zinevsky subsequently wrote, I remember the enthusiasm that seized the Congress when the chairman, Yakov Sverdlov, announced that one of the leaders of the Menshevik internationalists, Comrade Larin, wanted to greet the delegates. To thunderous applause, barely hobbling along on a paralyzed leg and shaking all over with nervousness, Larin moved slowly down the aisle to the speaker's platform. The nearer he approached to it, the louder the applause became. Larin's remarks to the delegates were in part an earnest appeal for revolutionary unity. When you are being attacked, it is the obligation of every honest internationalist to be with you, he said. The time has come to build a united revolutionary social democratic party and to transfer power into the hands of the revolutionary democracy. At the same time, Lerin's talk was a warning against resorting to violent revolutionary action. He affirmed bluntly, among us are some who are apprehensive about your overly great permissiveness toward the military organization. We know that during the movement of July 3rd to 5th, the military organization was calling for immediate action at the very same time that the political powers of the party were agitating against a coming out. 
I heard comrades say that the Soviets of workers and soldiers' deputies have adopted a reactionary position, and so, down with the Soviets, we will build our own organization. This is precisely the kind of dangerous road along which we would not be able to accompany you. Our task is not to destroy the Soviets and not to create new organizations, but to bring about changes in the composition of the present Soviets. We are opposed to rash methods. The Soviets are elective institutions. Obviously, much of Lenin's speech conflicted with Lenin's position, yet the official Congress protocols indicate that the applause following his remarks was as tumultuous as it had been before them. Again, Elin Zanevsky commented on the episode. To get a feeling of what occurred at the Congress when Lenin finished his speech, you have to imagine the atmosphere of persecution and repression in which our party found itself. At this moment, every expression of sympathy and support was especially valued. It seemed that Comrade Martov, and with him all that was alive and talented within the Menshevik fraction, would return to our united social democratic ranks. Principally because of problems in arriving at a consensus on fundamental theoretical issues, and also because of difficulties caused by the absence from the Congress of Lenin, Trotsky, Kamenev, and other key party leaders, the delegates agreed toward the end of their deliberations to postpone once again the adoption of a new party program. Hence, to the extent that fundamental theoretical questions relating to the development of the revolution were argued out at the Congress, this was done mainly in the course of debate on the current political situation. The working sessions of July 30th to 31st, during which the debate took place, were undoubtedly the most important of the entire Congress. With Lenin out of action, Trotsky had been slated to, to deliver the main speech and to present a draft resolution on the current political situation. When Trotsky was arrested two days before the start of the Congress, Stalin was hastily recruited to perform this task. It is noteworthy that on this occasion, supporters of the tactical program advocated by Lenin left very little to chance. Kronstadt Bolsheviks had run off copies of on slogans for every delegate and these were, di were distributed shortly before Stalin's speech. And, very likely as a result of lobbying efforts by the Leninists, Stalin's remarks to the Sixth Congress on the prevailing situation and course for the future paralleled Lenin's views much more closely than had Stalin's speeches at the Second City C Conference. This is not to suggest that Stalin's position now coincided with Lenin's in every respect. During a discussion early in the Congress, for example, Stalin declared that at the present time, where state power lies is unclear. And at another point in the Congress, Stalin discussing the Soviets showed that he was much less negatively inclined toward them than was Lenin. Still in his main speech on the current political situation, Stalin characterized the provisional government as a puppet manipulated by the counter-revolution. He was critical of comrades who feel that because capitalism is poorly developed in Russia, the goal of a socialist revolution is utopian, contending that the demand that Russia should delay socialist changes until the revolution in Europe began is rank pedantry. Subsequently, echoing Lenin, Stalin declared that the peaceful stage of the revolution was over and insisted that the old slogan, all power to the Soviets, had to be dropped. Upon completing his speech, Stalin put before the Congress a 10-point draft resolution on the current political situation, which, one is tempted to surmise, was written for the most part by Lenin. The first seven points of this resolution defined the course of the Russian Revolution through the July days in terms very similar to those in Lenin's theses. At the decisive points, namely at the front and in Petersburg, this portion of the resolution stated State power is in the hands of the counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie, supported by the military clique of the Army High Command. Points 8 through 10 of the resolution dealt with the condition and role of the Soviets and the party's immediate tactical program in a manner also strongly reminiscent of Lenin. Point 8 suggesting directly that the existing Soviets were bankrupt and a liability. The peaceful progress of the revolution and the non-violent transfer of power to the Soviets had become impossible, and the most appropriate slogan for the party was the complete liquidation of the counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie. 
Points 9 and 10 affirm that the success of the next revolution would depend on how quickly and thoroughly the majority of the people learned the futility of hopes for compromise with the bourgeoisie. However, the text implied that the proletariat, particularly the workers of Petrograd, would be compelled to seize power at the first opportunity. I.e. when political, economic, and military conditions had become sufficiently catastrophic. Regardless of whether or not the mass of the population had come to recognize the necessity of a new revolution through their own experience. As at the Second City Conference, arguments relating to the current political situation in general and the Stalin resolution in particular centered chiefly on the seminal issue of the practical future of the Soviets, heretofore the focal point of every delegate's political activity and hopes. Konstantin Yurinev, a close associate of Trotsky, began the debate by asking skeptically, up to now we have been consolidating our forces around one organ, the Soviets, in what form are we to consolidate our forces now? Yurinev also wondered why the slogan, all power to the Soviets, was necessarily inappropriate for a violent stage in the revolution. The Stalin resolution proposed, he concluded, that we adopt a course that would be disastrous for our revolutionary gains. If we adopt it, we will be headed in the direction of isolating the proletariat from the peasantry and the broad masses of the population. Paragraphs 8 to 10 must be drastically revised. Volodarsky rushed to the speaker's platform after Yurinev had stepped down. They tell us that since the peaceful period of the revolution has ended, the slogan, all power to the Soviets, is outdated. Is this really so? He demanded. Do we need to maintain the slogan, all power to the Soviets, in the same form as before July 3rd to 5th? Certainly not. But you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We must simply modify our slogan, all power to the Soviets, roughly as follows. All power to the proletariat, supported by the poorer peasantry and revolutionary democracy organized in the Soviets of workers, soldiers and peasants, deputies. Alesha, oh, holy fuck, um, Zaparidze, definitely did not pronounce that right, leader of the Bolshevik organization in Baku, who had been elected a candidate member of the Central Committee the previous day, spoke out in the same vein. At the time of the July days, the Bolsheviks had been making significant strides in building support in the Baku Soviet, and Tsaropidze was critical of Stalin for, as he put it, equating Soviets in the provinces with the Central Executive Committee. If earlier the provincial Soviets expressed the Central Executive Committee's views, they don't know, they don't now, he said. While we are living through a period of counter-revolution, we must fight for the Soviets. And as revolutionary defenders of the idea of rule by the Soviets, we will, we will acquire commanding importance in them. After July 4th, there was a change in the tactics of the proletarian party. Monolsky pointed out, the party found it necessary to shift from offense to the defense of positions won in the revolution. With this disadvantageous correlation of forces, to introduce maximalist slogans as the left wing of our party is now doing, is to adopt tactics of desperation. Fixing mistrust upon the Soviets, we risk facilitating their eviction from the Torida Palace and the Smolny Institute. We have to recognize that in Russia, 90% of the population is petty bourgeois, and consequently, tactics which isolate the proletariat from the petty bourgeoisie must be acknowledged to be harmful. 15 Congress delegates took the floor during this debate, most of them using every second of their allotted 15 minutes of speaking time. Of these delegates, eight expressed themselves in favor of retaining the slogan, all power to the Soviets. One, Bukharin, took an intermediate position, and six sided with Stalin. Among the most eloquent of those who took Stalin's position was Sokolnikov, like Stalin, he pointed to the expansion of the counter-revolution after the July days, and he went on, before we stood for the transfer of all power into the hands of the Soviets. But this is no longer a possibility. Heretofore, the Soviets were revolutionary organs, and we could present them as organs of power. They stopped being revolutionary, revolutionary organs the moment artillery was moved against the working class. 
In his comments, Sokolnikov seemed not to exclude the possibility that the Soviets might be rejuvenated, in particular that they might again become organs of insurrection. In this sense, his assessment of the prevailing situation differed from Lenin's. Nonetheless, Sokolnikov shared with Lenin the view that a popular mass uprising was next on Russia's revolutionary agenda. We must explain to the masses that the main issue is not the Soviets, but organizing the masses for an uprising, he declared. At this point, the audience burst into applause. He continued, It is necessary to attract the peasant masses away from the petty bourgeois leaders, explaining to them that land will be transferred to them only with the support of, pro of a proletarian rising. For the peasant masses, the road to a socialist revolution lies in support of the proletarian avant-garde. Ivar Smilga, earlier far and away the most militantly inclined member of the Central Committee, echoed Sokolnikov, Quoting extensively from on slogans, he declared, not only Vol Volodarsky, but even an old social democrat like Noggin is mistaken. Power is in the hands of a military clique. In order for power to come into the hands of those classes which will work for the expansion of the revolution, it is necessary to overthrow the existing government. Expressing the view that the Soviets had committed suicide by rejecting power when they could have had it, he suggested that conditions for a new revolution revolutionary eruption were developing rapidly, and that the Bolsheviks would be obliged to take initiative when the explosion came. No one has the right to deprive us of this initiative if fate gives us another chance to stand at the head of the movement, he insisted. Comrade Yurinev talks of caution, he added. Let me remind him of Danton's words. In revolution, one needs boldness, boldness, and more boldness. One of the last to take the floor during the sixth Congress debate over the current political moment was the newly elected Central Committee member from Moscow, Andrei Bubnov. Taking issue with Noggin, who had attempted earlier to minimize the significance of differences that had emerged over the issue of defining the current moment, he insisted that these were quite serious, mirroring the fundamental differences of opinion over the development of the revolution at the April conference. Bubnov then went on to defend the arguments of the left. The Soviets have no power now, he affirmed. They are rotting. There can be no illusions about this. If previously we spoke of the transfer of power, that term is now obsolete. We must build up our strength for the decisive battle, for the seizure of power. The slogan of transferring power to the Soviets has to go. On the afternoon of July 31st, as soon as arguments on the current political situation were completed, Zaparidze, <laughs> Zaparidze moved that the Stalin resolution not be put to an immediate vote, and instead that a committee be formed to draw up a new one. As provided for in Zaparidze's motion, the work of this committee was to be guided both by the Stalin resolution and by a statement on the current moment, embodying the views of the moderates, which had been adopted a few days earlier by Moscow Bol Bolsheviks. Congress delegates, while accepting the idea of postponing a vote on the current moment and of having a committee study the problem further, stipulated that the Stalin resolution be the basis for the resolution, which this committee would draft. Subsequently elected to the resolution's committee were Stalin, Sokolnikov, Bubnov, Militin, and Noggin, and two representatives of the Moscow Regional Bureau. Bukharin and Georgi Lomov. These seven delegates spent many hours attempting to resolve differing assessments of the prevailing situation, possibly receiving some advice from Lenin and Raslov. The resolution which they formulated and which was adopted by unanimous vote of the Congress, with four abstentions on August 3rd, was a compromise between the two contending sides. Apart from omitting some particularly hostile references to the Mensheviks and SRs, the first half of this resolution, which defined the course of the revolution through the July days, followed Stalin's draft re resolution almost verbatim. The committee resolution affirmed that the peaceful transfer of power to the Soviets had become an impossibility and substituted the slogan, complete liquidation of the dictatorship of the counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie, for the slogan, all power to the Soviets. At the same time, an entirely new section, taken straight from the statement of the Moscow Bolsheviks, 
was introduced into the committee resolution. This section specified that the party was to take upon itself the role of leading fighter against the counter-revolution, protecting mass organizations in general and the Soviets in particular from counter-revolutionary attacks. In these organs, the party was to work with all possible energy to strengthen the position of internationalists, consolidating around itself all elements dedicated to the struggle against the counter-revolution. Hence, for the foreseeable future, the central focus of the party's activities was still to be the Soviets, and indeed the possibility of working with majority socialists in defense of the revolution was, for practical purposes, left open. Moreover, missing entirely from the resolution adopted by the Congress were explicit references to a new revolution, as well as suggestions regarding the possibility that the seizure of power by the Bolsheviks might precede their acquisition of majority support in the country. The concluding paragraphs of the resolution stated simply that the proletariat was to avoid succumbing to provocations and was to direct its energies toward the organization and preparation of its forces, for the moment when the national crisis and deep mass upsurge had created propitious conditions for the urban and rural poor to support the struggle of workers against the bourgeoisie. At this juncture, um, I think I lost my spot. At this juncture, the task of these classes would be to take power into their own hands. What then was the significance of the programmatic decisions of the Sixth Congress? Officially, the slogan, All Power to the Soviets, was now withdrawn. It is missing from all official Bolshevik Party documents throughout the month of August. Beyond this, however, the decisions seemed to have had little practical impact. The party remained pointed in the direction of a socialist revolution, as it had been since April. This course had received solid endorsement by the Congress, but the crucial questions of how and when were still left vague. Intra-party programmatic differences were not resolved. As Bubnov explained in a report on the work of the Sixth Congress to a meeting... I lost my spot again. <laughs> to, a, okay. to a meeting of the Moscow Regional Bureau. At the Congress, as at the April Conference, there emerged two points of view, two tendencies, which were not brought out definitely enough and which remained in concealed form. Furthermore, the party's decisions notwithstanding, many mass organizations in Petrograd continued to view the creation of a revolutionary Soviet government as the solution to their most pressing problems. At the time of the Kornilo Kornilov affair in late August, the goal of an exclusively socialist regime had come to be nearly universally shared by Petrograd workers and soldiers, and the Bolsheviks themselves were forced to formally resurrect their old rallying, rallying cry, all power to the Soviets. While bitterness and hostility toward the Bolsheviks on the part of Petrograd workers and soldiers evaporated within a few weeks after the July uprising, by early August there were numerous unmistakable signs that, with its apparatus intact, the Bolshevik party had embarked on a new period of growth. This resurgence was reflected in the frequently voiced complaints by local Menshevik and SR leaders of numerous defections to the Bolsheviks. It was mirrored as well in Bolshevik gains in strictly local balloting in Kronstadt and in scattered elections for the Petrograd Soviet. Factory workers and garrison soldiers could recall their representatives in the Soviet whenever they saw fit, and during the first half of August, Bolshevik supporters in several Petrograd industrial plants took advantage of growing dissatisfaction with the policies of the Central Soviet organs to substitute Bolsheviks for deputies advocating the programs of the moderate socialists. The Bolsheviks did not obtain a majority in the Petrograd Soviet itself until the beginning of September. However, an early indication that the Mensheviks and SRs were in for difficulties there came on August 7th, at the first meeting of the workers' section since the July days. According to an agenda prepared by the Soviet leadership on that day, the workers' section was to discuss some organizational questions and also to make preparations for a conference on national defense scheduled to open in the capital the next day. But Bolshevik representatives in the section supported by the left SRs would have, done, would have none of this. 
They demanded that the meeting immediately discuss the plight of arrested internationalists and the government's decision to restore the death penalty at the front. In a vote on this proposal, a majority supported the Bolsheviks. The deputies next listened to an impassioned appeal on behalf of imprisoned leftists by the indefatigable Volodarsky, as well as defense of the, of the authorities by Dan and Gotts. By an overwhelming margin, they then voted for a Bolshevik resolution specifying that the arrest and persecution of comrades belonging to the extreme left represented a blow to the revolutionary cause, a shameful stain which served only the interests of the counter-revolution. The resolution demanded, among other things, the immediate release of all those arrested after the July days, who were not yet formally charged, early public trials for those indicted, and prosecution of all officials responsible for illegally depriving citizens of their liberty. The deputies, the deputies, even named a special commission to express sympathy and support personally to Trotsky, Lunikarsky, Kolontai, and other political prisoners. Moreover, they adopted a resolution by Martov condemning the restoration of capital punishment as a measure having openly counter-revolutionary aims. This resolution lambasted the Central Executive Committee for not opposing capital punishment and demanded that the provisional government rescind the measure. Citywide elections held on August 20th for a new Petrograd City Duma provided even more tangible evidence of the rapid Bolshevik recovery. Attaching considerable significance to these elections, the Bolsheviks had devoted some attention to them even before the July days. The July defeat served simply to fortify their, their determination to make a good showing, as an editorial in Rabachi E. Soldat on August 9th put it, this will be the first important engagement of the class struggle in the completely changed post-July 3rd to 5th circum circumstances. If the cadets win the election, the revolution will have been dealt a mighty blow. If the defensists win, we will have the same mess as before. The victory of our party would be the first triumph of the revolution over the counter-revolution. From August 12 to 15, the attention of all political groups in Petrograd was focused on the Moscow State Conference. In the last few days before the Duma elections, however, the competition for votes became more feverish. Leading cadets such as Molokov, Shingarev, Nabokov, and Turko Turkova now took to the stump. Molokov referring to dis district Duma elections held in May in which cadets had been had done poorly, declared that citizens of Petrograd now had the opportunity to retake examinations. They had failed earlier when they entrusted control of local Dumas to parties that occupied themselves with various fantasies. The Bolsheviks, the Bolsheviks had laid ambitious plans for their campaign, and as the day of reckoning approached, party officials nervously took stock of all that remained undone. Still, party workers had managed to organize an impressive number of political rallies and meetings, and to inundate working class districts of the capital with campaign leaflets. The party's efforts had received a great boost with the appearance of soldat and proletari just as the campaign became intense. Moreover, worsening economic conditions and the unpopular policies of the government and the majority socialists obviously worked to the Bolsheviks' advantage, a situation which they exploited to the fullest. Each worker and soldier is going to have to decide for himself whether he wants workers to wallow in the mud and stench of the ghettos, without schools or light, without adequate transportation facilities declared an editorial in Soldat on election eve. If this, is what we, if this is what he wants, then he should vote for our opponents. On the other hand, if he wants those streets in the working class suburbs that are now breeding places for disease to be sanitary, if he wants to see them paved and lighted and surrounded by schools and gardens, let him vote for the Bolsheviks. The same day's issue of proletariat claimed, only your party is striving for fundamental radical changes in city government, only our party favors shifting the entire tax burden from the poor to the rich. Most of all, the party sought to capitalize on popular fears regarding the dangers of counter-revolution by associating all the Bolsheviks as rivals with the assaults of the extreme right. As an editorial in Soldat on August 19th put it, 
In these elections, soldiers and workers would have to decide whether they wanted their city run by those who joined with the capitalists and landowners in issuing penal laws against workers and in decreeing capital punishment, who complain about higher wages for labor, decide on mass layoffs and keep comrades locked up in prison, driving them to hunger strikes and death. The same theme was emphasized in a long front page appeal for votes on election day by Stalin in Proletary. Wrote Stalin, the party of people's freedom, the cadet party defends the interests of large landowners and capitalists. The party of people's freedom insisted on the, on the offensive at the front and worked for the triumph of the counter-revolution. A vote for the party of Milikov is a betrayal of oneself, of one's wife and children, and of one's brothers in the rear and at the front. The Menshevik and SRs defend the interests of secure petty proprietors in the cities and in the countryside. To vote for these parties means to vote for a union with a counter-revolution against workers and poor peasants. It means to endorse arrests in the rear and capital punishment at the front. Inasmuch as the objective of the campaign was to mobilize the broadest possible support, the Bolshevik campaign literature of the time contained few references to potentially divisive aspects of the party, party's theoretical and tactical program. Even the term Bolshevik seemed to have been used sparingly, perhaps because of the danger that it was still tainted by the German agent charges. Every vote for List 6, the list of social democratic internationalists, was billed simply as a blow for the revolution against the counter-revolution. Trumpeted proletariat on August 15th and again on August 18th and 19th. Every worker, peasant, and soldier must vote for our list because only our party is struggling staunchly and bravely against the raging counter-revolutionary dictatorship of the bourgeoisie and large landowners. Only our party is fighting the re-imposition of capital punishment, the destruction of worker and soldier organizations, and the suppression of all the freedoms won with the blood and sweat of the people. You must vote for our party because it alone is struggling bravely with the peasantry against large landowners, with workers against factory owners, with the oppressed everywhere against the oppressors. After the balloting for the city Duma, it took several days to tabulate the final vote. When the results were in, the Bolsheviks, showing surprising strength in every section of the capital, received 183,624 votes giving them 67 seats in the new Duma. The Bolshevik tally was second only to that of the SRs, who received 205,659 votes and 75 seats. This represented an improvement of 14% over the Bolsheviks' performance in the district Duma elections of late May. The cadet vote was 114,483 votes, giving them 42 seats, while the Mensheviks trailed with 23,552 votes and 8 seats. What did the vote mean? Some contemporary observers were inclined to ignore the Bolshevik success altogether. Thus, by not very deft manipulation of the figures, a writer for the cadet paper REC claimed that the election results revealed growing support for cadets, cadet positions among true residents of Petrograd. Significantly more forthright was a post-election analysis by a political observer for Novaya Zizit. This writer stated directly that the elections had been a striking and incontrovertible victory for the Bolsheviks. The success of the party, he explained, was a reflection of the extremely tense mood of workers and substantial numbers of soldiers, and their alienation from the policies of the Soviet majority and the new course of the government. The victory was undoubtedly facilitated by the unpardonable persecution of Bolshevik leaders, which inevitably began with the great pomp or with great pomp and always burst like a soap bubble. The repression of the extreme left served only to increase its popularity among the masses, he added. The Bolshevik press was closed, the party's agitation was constrained, but the enforced silence was the most elegant, eloquent propaganda. Like Rek, the Menshevik Rabakoya Rub, Gazeta was at first inclined to minimize the import of the impressive Bolshevik vote. 
an initial account of the election in Robochea Gazeta suggested that the Bolshevik total had been greatly inflated by the votes of rightists, whose aim was to magnify the red threat the red threat in order to justify their own political program. The very next day, however, the same paper reassessed the election and arrived at conclusions very similar to those of Novaya Zizin, commented Robochea Gazeta. One must conclude that the Bolshevik triumph was enormous, greatly exceeding the expectations of the Bolsheviks themselves. For this Bolshevik success, we are indebted to the inadequacy of creative work on the part of the democracy, which has not given the masses any concrete results. We are also indebted to the system of repression, chaotic, hasty at times, or hasty, at times ridiculous and senseless, which clothed the Bolsheviks in a halo of suffering, destroying the impact which the criminal action of July 3rd to 5th had had on the worker and soldier masses.